Okay, this is part two of the immune system lecture. So we're talking talk about the specific cells of the immune system. So the cells of the immune system are called lymphocytes. They're involved in the adaptive immune response. All right, so leukocytes of the innate immune system are diverse. All right, so there's different types. So we talked about the eosinophils, neutrophils. But those of the adaptive immune system are primarily involved in two distinct types. All right, it has to do with their site of maturation. So where they are going to become immunocompetent is what that means, where they become uh, able to recognize self from non-cells. Self. So B cells, which are going to be um, uh, becoming mature in the bone marrow, they secrete antibodies, and we call that humoral immunity. T cells, which become immunocompetent in the thymus, they are part of your body's cell-mediated immunity, Okay, so that hunts down pathogens, eliminates them along with other immune responses, depending on the type of T cell. So B cells, uh, B for B cells, B for bone marrow, they secrete antibodies, okay, and the humoral immunity, or cell-mediated immunity being with the T cells, okay. Uh, B cells are also called antibody-mediated uh, immunity as well, okay. T cells, T for T cells, T for thymus, hunts down the pathogens and produces immune responses, so these lymphocytes, B and T, are formed, matured, and activated to distinct components of the immune system. So like I said, lymphocytes are produced in the bone marrow, which is located in the cavities of your bone, specifically at the, the distal and the proximal epiphyses of the bone, the top and the bottom part. Okay, in an adult, in a developing embryo, all of the bone marrow is red bone marrow, where they're formed. B cells mature as well. They become immunocompetent in the bone marrow, while T cells are going to mature in the thymus. So they all start out in the bone marrow, but then the T cells mature in the thymus. Lymphocyte activation. So lymphocytes recognize antigens and become activated in the spleen and the lymph nodes. Okay, so that's where they are then sent out to face invaders. Lymphocyte transport. Lymphocytes circulate through the blood and the secondary organs of the immune system. So those are things like the spleen, the lymph nodes, and all of the lymph fluid. Lymphatic ducts are thin-walled branching tubules that transport lymph throughout the body in the lymphatic system. So lymph is going to be this fluid that runs kind of alongside. Uh, lymph vessels run alongside your blood vessels. And what they do is they, when the blood vessels are pumping blood, they sometimes, or they do, they secrete excess fluid. And that fluid is picked up by the lymphatic system, and the lymphatic system transports it uh, ultimately back to the heart. It also is going to um, uh, carry these lymphocytes throughout the body. So here's the components of the adaptive immune system. And in green, you've got all the lymph vessels. Okay, so here's the bone marrow. Okay, it's shown here kind of uh, all over, but it's in an adult. It's only in the epiphyses. Um, those cells then are produced, and they move through the bloodstream where the T cells will mature here in the thymus. Okay, the spleen is located here. The lymph nodes are these areas, these bulging areas. And these are all places where these cells are going to kind of hang out until they're needed. The discovery of B cell receptors. So the antibodies produced by B cells are identical in structure to its BCR, B cell receptors, but are not anchored to the plasma membrane. Okay. They're secreted to move throughout the body. So the antibodies produced by them are, are not going to stay in the plasma membrane. They're going to go out through the body. Both the B cell receptor and the antibodies produced by B cells belong to a family of proteins called immunoglobulins. All right, And we're going to talk about the different types of immunoglobulins in a second, which are critical to the adaptive immune response. All right, So there's five classes of immunoglobulins that act as B cell receptors for ant or antibodies. Okay, So... Immunoglobulin, B cell receptor, antibodies, all kind of the same thing. So we've got IgG, IgG, IgE, IgA, and IgM. And how these different types of antibodies are, are distinguished is by the heavy chain it contains. So you don't need to worry too much about what that, the chemistry of that, um, but rather its distinct function in the immune system. So this isn't something that, that you would need to memorize. Um, it would be, you know, even if you were... I would think working with this, um, you would have it kind of as a reference, but these are the different classes of immunoglobulins or the different types of antibodies. These are all antibodies, and um, the IgG antibodies are the most abundant secreted antibody. They circulate in blood, protect against bacteria, viruses, and toxins. So if you hear about an immune response being generated by a vaccine, it's producing these IgG antibodies, okay? 
IgD present in the membranes of immature B cells, rarely secreted. Okay, serves as a B cell receptor. IgE secreted in minute amounts. Uh, so these IgE antibodies elevated would be uh, signaling that you have a parasitic worm. So if you were to do have a blood test and get these antibodies tested, this would be what they would be looking for. IgA, most common antibody in breast milk, tears, saliva, mucus, mucus sliding the respiratory tracts. Okay. IgM, uh, notice the structure is a little different. Some of these are monomer, dimer, this one's a, a pentamer. Uh, first type of antibody to appear in an infection is the IgM, binds to an antigen at once, effective at clumping viruses and bacteria, so they can be phagocytized or eaten by the right blood cells. Uh, the monomeric form of this serves as a BCR. All right, so in this figure, we're looking at kind of the, the response here, the antibody-mediated and the cell-mediated response. So again, without getting too much into this, here's your antigen. It's, it's coming to the body, um, and that antigen is engulfed by a macrophage. Okay, and when the macrophage is going to uh, ingest the antigen, what it does is it uh, sticks off the top of it something called the MHC complex, and what that does is it presents the antigen uh, to identify the invader to all the other cells around it, and what that does is it activates the helper T cells. So what do the helper T cells do? They're going to divide to form memory helper T cells, Okay, and then they're going to go into the bank for continued surveillance. They're also going to divide and proliferate to make effector helper T cells, which are going to activate two different responses, depending on what it is. The B cell response, the antibody-mediated, or the cell-mediated response. So we'll start with the antibody-mediated response. So that's going to activate a naive B cell. Okay, the naive B cell is going to divide and provide its specific defenses, and it's going to proliferate into a plasma cell, which is going to secrete antibodies, a whole bunch of antibodies that are going to go out, and they're going to attach themselves to the pathogens or toxins outside of cells. Okay? They're also going to produce memory B cells so that they can go into that bank and quickly provide a response to a future antigen. Okay? Um, let's say the cell-mediated response. Again, it all depends on type of pathogen what's going to be the best course of action. So the cell-mediated response starts with a naive cytotoxic T cell, which is going to divide into memory cytotoxic T cells for continued surveillance, and effector cytotoxic T, cytotoxic T cells, which are going to go out and they are going to um, uh, target these cells that are a problem and destroy them. Okay. Uh, so so we see this whole response taking place in response to a antigen that is a specific antigen. All right, so kind of a little more in words here. So responding to future infections and immunological memory. So this is what really sets this apart from innate immunity. So activated B and T cells produce specialized cells called memory cells. So they don't participate in the primary immune response. So this is the primary immune response here with the antibodies, the plasma cells, the cytotoxic T cells. Uh, rather, these are going to be kind of banked away until the, uh, uh, after the infection has been cleared, and they can remain in your spleen, your lymph nodes for years, decades, uh, ready to mount an immune response, and we call that immunological memory. Okay, So these cells provide a second immune response if the same antigen enters the body again very quickly. So it's like we cut out all of this stuff, and we literally just go right to here, and we can real quick get rid of it before you get sick. Okay. So this kind of has the different um, lymphocytes, uh, what their mode of activation is, what the cells that comes from them are, and what the function is of those resulting cells. Okay, so you can take a look at this and use this as a reference. So we can kind of get this process to work on its own by using vaccines. So what a vaccine is, is it contains antigens from a pathogen or a killed or weakened version of the pathogen itself. Okay, so basically what happens is we take an attenuated, a shortened or live virus, okay, consists of complete virus particles that have lost the ability to grow rapidly. Okay, so essentially what you're doing is you're putting into the body a small, non-infectious part of the virus, tricks your body into making the immune response as if the virus were there. So you have the memory now, the memory immunity, without actually being sick. So after vaccination, the body mounts that primary immune response, produces the memory cells, 
And if a second infection occurs, those memory cells respond quickly and eliminate the threat before the illness appears. So the vaccines are our best defense against um, disease. Now, there are some viruses that mutate very quickly, such as influenza and HIV, uh, and they're present in the immune system with a constantly changing array of epitopes. Okay, epitopes are, the, the, are markers on antibodies. Memory cells that were effective during a previous infection are unlikely to bind to the changed epitopes or these um, antigen things on little markers on the antigen and trigger a response. So as a result, it's difficult to design an effective vaccine against things that are going to mutate very quickly. So you need to get a new flu vaccine every year when the flu mutates. Um, now, the thing with HIV isn't so much the mutating, but what HIV does. HIV is a virus that actually attacks your immune system. So someone with HIV isn't going to mount an immune response. So it's very difficult to produce a vaccine for a virus that actually doesn't mount an immune response. Okay, so HIV is a totally different animal. Now, with the coronavirus, many vaccines now are being developed with many different for COVID-19, I should say, there's many coronaviruses, but for COVID-19, there's many different vaccines, and um, the vaccines that are being tested right now are mounting an immune response, an effective immune response with antibodies that match uh, COVID-19. So the promise of a vaccine for COVID-19 is very much uh, going to be a reality, hopefully very soon. Um, and I believe most of the leading virus, uh, or the most of the leading vaccines are using RNA uh, to produce the vaccine, which is uh, a very new system. We haven't had an RNA vaccine. So it's very exciting to see the breakthroughs that are being put forward with this vaccine. So what happens when the immune system doesn't work correctly? So a healthy immune system can beat most things without any medical intervention. However, if there's a dysfunctional response, it can be a liability to an organism's health and survival. So one of those things that could be a problem, potentially, is allergies. So allergy or an allergic reaction is an abnormal, overactive response to an antigen. So certain people produce IgE antibodies, which are normally response to worms, okay, uh, in response to things like pollen, nuts, dander, cats, dander, dog dander, right? And we call those allergens because they trigger this over-response, all right? So it's not a normal. You shouldn't, there's no real need. Cat dander isn't going to kill you, right? But your body produces these IgE antibodies, um, really when they shouldn't. And it can be a very dangerous situation if someone is, is producing these much uh, in much too much uh, frequency. Okay. The production of these antibodies in allergic response triggers a series of events known as the hypersensitive reaction. So when a person is first exposed to an allergen, receptors on certain leukocytes bind to those IgE antibodies that are produced. This binding occurs at the constant region of the IgE heavy chains. Once this binding event occurs, the cells and the person are said to be sensitized. If the person is later exposed to the same allergen, the variable regions of these cell surface antibodies bind to the allergen molecules, cross-link them, signaling the cell to rapidly secrete histamines, cytokines, chemokines, other substances. So this is going to cause all kinds of over-responses, dilation of blood vessels, contraction of your airway, secretion of mucus, so you're overproducing mucus, you're overdilating your blood vessels, you can be actually closing up and constricting your airway, right? And this can be very dangerous. So like I said, these hypersensitive reactions can cause blood pressure to plummet, blood pressure to plummet oxygen to the brain to be reduced, and the person to lose consciousness, okay? Um, severe contractions can cause vomiting, diarrhea, specifically in the digestive tract, and complete constriction of airways. So this is very bad reaction, and we call that anaphylactic shock, and you may have heard of that with people having bee stings. Peanuts can, can go into anaphylactic shock, and a, a shot of adrenaline will counteract those symptoms, um, or epinephrine and adrenaline. So they, an EpiPen will stick that into someone's leg, get that shot of adrenaline, and will um, bring these symptoms down. <clears throat> so another example of a... Uh, a problem with the immune system is autoimmunity. So we mentioned how the uh, immune system's job is to distinguish self from non-self. So if the immune system cannot distinguish self from non-self and starts attacking self, that's autoimmunity. 
So for example, multiple sclerosis, MS, is the production of cytotoxic T cells that actually go out and attack the body's own myelin sheath of nerve fibers, which remember cover the axons. So that leads to an inability to control your muscles. Rheumatoid arthritis is when the immune system attacks your joints. All right, attacks the uh, the joint uh, fluids and um, the cartilage in your joints, causing painful inflammation and degradation of your joints. Type one diabetes uh, differ from type two diabetes, which is caused by diet and environment. Type one diabetes is genetic. And it occurs when the cytotoxic T cells attack and kill the insulin secreting cells of the pancreas. So now you can't regulate your blood sugar, uh, your blood glucose levels appropriately. So something called the hygiene hypothesis states that autoimmune allergic responses arise in individuals who have experienced less exposure to pathogens and parasites due to hygienic practices. This correlation points to close ties between the co-evolution of the immune system and the invaders it defends against us. So this hygiene hypothesis states that, you know, the more you wash your hands, which is not really good advice to give now, the less likely you are to, um, uh, to be defended. Okay, so it's an interesting thing to take a look at. Okay, different um, than um, autoimmune is immunodeficiency diseases. So these diseases badly impair the adaptive immune response. So children that are born with a genetic disorder known as Severe Combined Immunodeficiency Disease, SCID, do not have a normal immune system and are susceptible to opportunistic pathogens that would normally not cause a problem. So something as simple as a cold can grow out of control for a child with SCID. Another example of immunodeficiency disease is from HIV. So HIV is a virus that is going to specifically infect and kill macrophages and T-cells. Okay, so essentially this is a virus that will go in and it will attack your immune system. So as this infection continues, you start to see these levels very, 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 get very low. And when a person's um, CD4 T-cells get so low that they can't effectively perform an adaptive immune response, we say that they have AIDS. And... No one dies of AIDS. They die of an opportunistic infection that kills them because they don't have an immune system anymore. All right, so that wraps up this chapter. I hope you learned a little bit more about the immune system and how, to, how it works to protect your body.